This video teaches you the basics of the ileostomy and colostomy and provides an overview of the major nutrition recommendations for them. An ostomy is a purposeful connection between the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract and the skin of the abdominal wall. When the connection is made from the ileum, which is the third and final segment of the small intestine, it's called an ileostomy. And when the connection is made from the colon, which is the longest part of the large intestine, it's called a colostomy. The opening for both the ileostomy and colostomy is called a stoma. If you've watched my video on feeding tubes, then you've heard me talk about ostomies before. There's the gastrostomy, which gives access to the stomach, and there's the jejunostomy, which gives access to the jejunum. Although these are technically considered ostomies too, they have very different functions. The gastrostomy and jejunostomy offer a safe way to get nutrients into the body, whereas the ileostomy and colostomy provide a safe way to get waste out of it. The waste, which is often referred to as effluent, spills out of the stoma and is collected in a pouch. Then the pouch is emptied once it's one-third to one-half full. Together, the ileostomy and colostomy fall under a set of procedures for fecal diversion. They're created when expelling feces through the anus is considered unsafe or impossible. Sometimes, a disease or injury results in the need to remove the entire large intestine. Other times, the removal of a smaller section is needed, and feces is diverted to allow the surgical site to heal. I've even seen an ostomy created to assist in the management of an infection close to the anus, because daily exposure to feces was disrupting the healing process. These are just a few examples. Conditions associated with the placement of an ileostomy or colostomy include cancer, either from obstruction or damage from radiation therapy, inflammatory bowel disease, which includes ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, diverticular disease, complicated by an abscess, perforation, or fistula, and injury or trauma, which could happen from an event like a car accident. Placement can be temporary or permanent, depending on the feasibility of re-establishing elimination through the anus at a later time. Two terms that you'll definitely see with an ileostomy or colostomy are loop and end, which refer to the technique used to create them. On the one hand, loop is when a loop of the bowel is pulled through the abdominal wall and cut enough for the effluent to come out, but it's not severed. This makes it easier to reverse, since the ends needed to pull it back together are right there. On the other hand, end is when the bowel is severed, and only the proximal end is pulled through the abdominal wall. The remainder is either removed entirely, or left inside. This one can be temporary or permanent, but compared to the loop, it's more likely to be permanent. Finally, with a colostomy, you may also see it labeled as ascending, transverse, descending, or sigmoid. Each of these just refer to where along the colon the colostomy is located. There are additional variations for both the ileostomy and colostomy, but they're beyond the scope of this video. Now that we've covered the basics of the ileostomy and colostomy, we're going to look at what they mean for the digestion and absorption of nutrients. This will serve as a segue to establishing nutrition recommendations for minimizing the risk of complications. To understand how an ileostomy or colostomy affects a patient's nutritional needs, you first need to understand the functions of the ileum and colon. Under normal circumstances, the majority of fluid and nutrient absorption occurs in the first two segments of the small intestine. The ileum absorbs some fluid too. However, it's primarily responsible for the absorption of vitamin B12 and the reabsorption of bile acids as part of enterohepatic circulation. Those bile acids then participate in fat digestion as bile in the duodenum. 
The ileum also appears to decrease the gastrointestinal transit time by secreting the hormone peptide YY when exposed to unabsorbed lipids. This is called the ileal break. The large intestine, and the colon in particular, plays a key role in completing the absorption of fluid and extracting any remaining electrolytes like sodium and potassium. In addition to this, it's home to the highest density of gut bacteria. These bacteria feast on undigested food particles, and their activity has far-reaching effects on the body. One nutrition-related function is their ability to produce short-chain fatty acids, biotin, and vitamin K, which our body then absorbs and uses. With all of these functions in mind, we can begin to see the nutritional concerns of fecal diversion, and how those concerns differ whether a patient has an ileostomy or colostomy. When the passage of materials ends at the ileum, absorption of fluid and electrolytes will be incomplete, the absorption of vitamin B12 and reabsorption of bile acids can be impaired, and loss of the ileal break may accelerate intestinal transit time. The degree to which these occur depends on how much of the ileum remains. Undigested materials will also no longer have exposure to the same number and diversity of gut bacteria, posing a valid but mostly theoretical concern for downstream effects on health. When the passage of materials ends in the colon, fluid and electrolyte losses will depend on the location of the stoma. With the sigmoid and descending colostomy, fluid and electrolyte absorption is largely intact, and there's less concern for losses. But as you make your way closer to the small intestine, the amount of fluid in the effluent increases, and there's more concern for losses. Finally, for both, risk of complications is highest right after surgery. This includes risk of stoma blockage, which increases due to postoperative inflammation, and risk of dehydration, because intestinal adaptation hasn't occurred. Studies of humans and animals have shown that after a bowel resection, the capacity for absorption in the remaining segments increases. If you want a more comprehensive discussion of this, I left links for these two papers in the video description. In short, for some patients, after 2-3 to three months there's enough adaptation that fluid and nutrient losses don't become much of a concern. Nevertheless, other patients will experience significant losses and require careful management to avoid dehydration and nutrient deficiencies. All patients remain at high risk of acute complications when their course is complicated by ostomy malfunction, infection, recurrence of Crohn's disease, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and dietary indiscretion. At this stage, if you're enjoying the video, I'm going to ask that you hit the like button and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. YouTube has also added a thanks button, which allows you to contribute a few dollars to my addiction to caffeine. In this section, we're going to cover the major nutrition recommendations to minimize risk of complications. First, we'll look at dietary fiber in the first 4-6 to six weeks after surgery and beyond. Second, we'll talk about gas and odor producing foods. And third, we'll explore hydration. Patients with a new ileostomy or colostomy are recommended to follow a low-fiber diet for the first 4-6 to six weeks after surgery. The main reason for this is that fiber is indigestible. It undergoes little change as it passes through the digestive tract and can get lodged in the stoma, preventing the passage of materials. As mentioned previously, this risk of blockage is increased right after surgery as the stoma is healing. I'll now add that the risk is higher with an ileostomy since the section of the bowel is thinner than the colon and the surgeon cannot make as big of an opening. This difference in risk remains even once the healing process is completed. Foods to avoid to minimize risk of blockage include fruits and vegetables with skin, raw vegetables, stringy vegetables like celery, corn, 
mushrooms, whole grains including popcorn, whole nuts and seeds, legumes, and fatty tough meats. Foods to include are lean soft meats, mashed pureed or boiled vegetables that are easily penetrated with a fork, soft fresh fruit like cantaloupe, honeydew, and banana, cooked or canned fruit, smooth nut or seed butters, and refined grains. These foods should be cut into small pieces, and patients should chew all foods thoroughly to further break down the particle size. After four to six weeks of the low fiber diet, patients can begin to reintroduce fiber containing foods. They should do this one food at a time, continue to chew all foods thoroughly, and closely monitor their tolerance to them. Signs of blockage include abdominal distension and minimal output. Symptoms include abdominal pain and cramping. Patients who suspect a blockage should contact their medical provider immediately. In the end, how much fiber and which specific foods a patient can tolerate will vary on a case-by-case -case basis, so it's difficult to give specific guidelines on where they should settle. Generally speaking, patients with a colostomy are able to tolerate more fiber than those with an ileostomy due to the difference in the size of the stoma. Fiber can also be a variable that requires adjustment when dealing with constipation or diarrhea. You can usually assist in the management of constipation by adding more fiber to the diet, and you can often assist in the management of diarrhea by removing it. When it comes to gas and odor producing foods, patients should be wary of them for as long as they have an ostomy. Excessive gas production is problematic because it fills the ostomy pouch up with air instead of effluent, a phenomenon that's called ballooning. When this happens, the pouch may become more visible to other people, or the gas can leak from it and release a foul odor, both of which the patient may find embarrassing. Ballooning results in a need to frequently empty the ostomy pouch. While this is mostly inconvenient, with some pouching systems it requires more manipulation of it and increases exposure of the stoma. These two things increase the risk of complications like leakage, tissue damage, and infection. There are pouches that can release gas through a vent or filter, but a lot of patients find that these features end up causing more issues than they're worth. Major gas-producing foods include broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, asparagus, leafy green vegetables, garlic, onions, apples, peaches, pears, and legumes. These should be avoided or at least consumed sparingly. To further minimize gas production, patients should also avoid carbonated beverages, chewing gum, drinking through a straw, smoking, and eating and drinking quickly. Minimizing odor can be achieved by avoiding the gas-producing foods and seeing how the body responds to other known contributors like fish and eggs. There are also a number of products on the market that help to eliminate odor. I've personally heard patients compliment the Hollister M9 Odor Eliminator, which comes in drops and as a spray. As we've already seen with an ileostomy and an ascending colostomy, fluid and electrolytes exit the gastrointestinal tract well before absorption is complete. Dehydration is the number one cause of readmissions for patients with ileostomies, leading to acute kidney injury and the development or progression of chronic kidney disease. Similar to what we saw with fiber, it's difficult to give specific guidelines for how much fluid somebody with an ileostomy should aim for each day. For a new ileostomy, normal output can be as high as 1200 to 1500 milliliters per day. Then after intestinal adaptation, it can go down to anywhere between 600 and 1200. So, we see a large variation within the same surgical procedure. Then with a colostomy, the normal output is anywhere between 200 and 600. Other factors that can contribute to fluid and electrolyte losses include physical activity, hot or cold climate, and infection.
As a general recommendation, patients should drink at least 80 ounces of fluid per day, and patients should avoid sodium restriction. Paying attention to both ostomy output and urine output is a critical component of assessing hydration status. Whenever possible, both should be carefully measured for at least a few weeks after surgery. If a patient is losing more than 1,500 milliliters of effluent and or producing less than 1,200 milliliters of urine per day, then they're at very high risk of complications. Other signs and symptoms of dehydration to watch out for include feelings of dizziness, headache, dry mouth, excessive thirst, and a dark urine color. In some cases, patients will be able to remain hydrated by consuming a sufficient amount of fluid and electrolytes through their normal food and beverage selections. However, there will be times when an acute or chronic increase in ostomy output requires a more stringent approach to management. A common recommendation for patients with high output, which is loosely defined as greater than 1500 milliliters per day, is that they should just drink more to catch up with their losses. Yet this is poor guidance and can actually worsen dehydration and electrolyte imbalances. Here, the concentration of the solution the patient drinks makes a meaningful difference. Beverages with a high concentration of sugar, like fruit juice, soda, and Ensure or Boost, can pull more water and electrolytes into the gastrointestinal tract from the bloodstream. This is also true for concentrated food sources of sugar, like desserts and sweet snacks, and any food, drink, or medication with a high concentration of sugar alcohols. Beverages with a low concentration of solute, like water, tea, and coffee, aren't ideal for rehydration either, since they have the potential to attract electrolytes and water from the bloodstream as well. So, when it comes to managing high ostomy output, patients should be encouraged to choose a solution that's designed to maximize absorption. Collectively, these are called oral rehydration solutions, and they contain a careful balance of water, sugar, sodium, and potassium. The solution that's cited most often in the literature is a recipe devised by the World Health Organization, which means patients must collect ingredients and make it themselves. Understanding that this solution lacks the taste and convenience for many patients to stick to it, I like to provide comparable options like Liquid IV, Drip Drop, Pedialyte, and Gatorade G2. These products tend to have a lower concentration of sodium, but are much more palatable and convenient, and can be used with sodium being added to them or elsewhere in the diet. Of note, these solutions won't substantially decrease ostomy output on their own. They're simply designed to enhance absorption and prevent dehydration from getting worse while the underlying cause of the high output is identified and treated. An oral rehydration solution can also be recommended as a prophylaxis so patients don't become dehydrated. In this case, a general recommendation is for one half of daily fluids to come from the oral rehydration solution, and the other one half come from beverages that are low in sugar. That's it for the major nutrition recommendations with an ileostomy and colostomy. One last topic I want to touch upon briefly is dietary supplements. Soluble fiber supplements like psyllium husk have been used to thicken effluent when the output is high and or watery. Although this may be useful for a stable, well-nourished patient to make their ostomy management a bit easier, these supplements are not recommended to patients who are malnourished or as a strategy to improve hydration status. This is because these supplements can bind water, electrolytes, and macronutrients in the small intestine. Therefore, a thicker effluent doesn't mean better absorption. Given the risk associated with soluble fiber supplements, a better way to thicken the effluent is to encourage the intake of refined starches like white bread, rice, pasta, and potatoes, 
crackers, pretzels, and bananas. For patients with an ileostomy, concern over the malabsorption of vitamin B12 makes it reasonable to suggest an annual measurement of the serum level. However, supplementation isn't always necessary due to intestinal adaptation or the patient having an ileostomy reversal surgery before they lose their body's storage of it. A standard multivitamin and multimineral to cover all micronutrients is appropriate and can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Here's a summary for the nutrition recommendations. 1. To reduce risk of stoma blockage, patients should be encouraged to follow a low-fiber diet for the first 4-6 to six weeks after surgery, cut foods into bite-sized pieces, and chew all foods thoroughly. When reintroducing fiber-containing foods, they should do it one food at a time and monitor their body's response closely. 2. To minimize gas production, patients should limit their intake of gas-producing foods and avoid carbonated beverages, chewing gum, drinking through a straw, smoking, and eating and drinking quickly. Gas-producing foods, as well as foods like fish and eggs, can also be consumed sparingly as a way to reduce odor. 3. Since they're at very high risk of dehydration, patients with an ileostomy or ascending colostomy should consume at least 80 ounces of fluid per day and avoid sodium restriction. They should also avoid concentrated sweets, sugar alcohols, and limit low-solute beverages whenever output is high. 4. Oral rehydration solutions can be used as a prophylaxis for dehydration and are integral to treating it. 5. Soluble fiber supplements can help to make watery stool easier to manage, but will not promote rehydration. If you want a screenshot of this, take it now. You can learn more about gastrointestinal diseases by clicking the images on your screen. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.